Philosophical thought doesn't arise in a vacuum, and British idealism is no exception. It emerged as a powerful intellectual reply to the Victorian crisis of faith that began in the mid-19th century, and its decline was mostly a result of the transforming political landscape of the 20th. This video presents an overview of the historical context in which British idealism arose and declined, and a summary of the thought of three great thinkers within the school. Let's go. The Victorian crisis of faith hit the British intellectual community in the 19th century. At that time, Britain was extremely religious. The 18th century had seen the rise to prominence of evangelical preachers like John Wesley and George Whitfield, and by the mid-19th century, evangelical Christianity had become embedded in Victorian society. 55% of children were enrolled in Sunday school. Almost all politicians were evangelically influenced, and evangelical pamphlets and sermons were the most common publications of the time. A young, well-to-do Victorian could well have heard a thousand sermons before coming of age, and by the time the firebrand preacher Charles Spurgeon died in 1892, he had sold 50 million copies of his sermons to a population of only around 30 million people. The ubiquity of the evangelical narrative in the UK led to material changes in Victorian politics. Duels and blood sports were suppressed, there were prison reforms, protections were introduced for child labourers, and slavery was abolished throughout the British Empire. The extent and impact of religious faith at this time is summed up well by the historian R.C.K. Ensel when he writes, No one will ever understand Victorian England who does not appreciate that among highly civilised countries is one of the most religious the world has ever known. Evangelicalism provided the lives of Victorians with both faith and meaning. It taught that our short earthly life was preliminary to an eternal one to come and that our actions in this world would all be judged by God and result in either eternal punishment or reward. This meant that every act committed was meaningful, because every act had eternal significance. Trouble for the evangelical view began to build in the 19th century. Evangelicalism was predicated on the idea that the Bible was literally and historically true. But advances in the natural sciences, combined with new techniques of textual criticism, began to put many foundational evangelical beliefs into doubt among the British educated. The process began with geology in the early part of the century, which made two relevant discoveries. The first was that the observable geological features require long timescales to develop. These long timescales conflicted with the date of creation determined by following the genealogical record in the Bible. The second discovery was that many early species, such as dinosaurs, have gone extinct. This was thought difficult to reconcile with the biblical account of God's efforts to preserve all species during the flood. Now, if geology proved a problem, biology was to make things worse. In 1859, Charles Darwin published On the Origin of Species, in which he presents his theory of evolution. This theory describes humanity as having emerged from primitive forms of life, a claim that sharply conflicts with the biblical account of the first humans falling from a state of perfection. Alongside this, methods of textual criticism began to be applied to scripture. These studies suggested that much of what was written in the Bible was influenced both by the circumstances of the time and the views of the human author. This way of viewing the Bible as a text undermined the evangelical claim that the words were divinely dictated. The intellectual challenges to the faith had an immediate impact on the British intellectual community. Confidence in the Bible and God as guarantors of meaning was severely shaken. This effect was compounded by the fact that the two dominant philosophical schools in mid-Victorian Britain, John Stuart Mill's Empiricism and Thomas Reed's Scottish School of Common Sense, were unable to justify the substance of religious claims. As the 19th century drew to a close, the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche declared that God is dead. By this he meant that the Western world no longer believed in the Christian God, and with God's death, the West had lost the only objective basis it had for meaning and morality. European philosophy developed from there to become what is now commonly known as continental philosophy, but in the UK, things went differently. In Britain, it was realised that there was a need for a metaphysical, even if not biblical, ground for values, and the source for this was found in German philosophical thought, primarily the works of Immanuel Kant, G.W. of Hegel, and later, Hermann Lotze. When Hegel's writings were introduced into the UK in the mid-19th century, Hegel was painted as the great defender of the Christian faith, and early proponents used his writings to defend Christianity against the threats from science. 
The argument was that Hegel had shown beyond doubt that thought and being are unified. This, they said, had two consequences. First, that materialism, the idea that reality consists only of matter, is self-contradictory. And second, since being extends beyond any human finite mind, it could only be a divine thought that encompasses being. In other words, they claimed that reality itself is in the mind of God, so science, far from being able to refute God's existence, must presuppose it in order to provide us with knowledge. However, the philosophical views these early idealists provided were not systematic. They were selective in the ideas of Hegel they were prepared to accept, many others they rejected, and they had so far failed to provide a defence of morality. The first truly systematic thinker of the British idealists was the Oxford philosopher T.H. Green. Green argued that the idea that science expresses ultimate truth was founded on empiricism, the view that knowledge comes to us through our senses. But he claimed that this view of knowledge had been discredited centuries earlier by the philosopher David Hume. Hume argued that we never see causation, but only a series of events that sometimes regularly coincide, and that we, by habit and without justification, project the idea of causation onto those events. From this observation, Green argues that the sequence of events presented to our senses lacks the organisation required to constitute knowledge. It becomes knowledge only because the human mind supplies the relations between things that provide our perceptions with their structure. The world we experience, then, is not a world merely of the senses, but one in which the mind plays an active role by synthesising our raw perceptions into a systematic whole. Further, since we experience only this mentally synthesised world, he thought it made no sense to talk about any other world outside it. Reality is itself mentally synthesised. In other words, empiricism is wrong, and idealism, which argues reality is ultimately mental, is right. Green goes on to label this mentally synthesised whole in which our finite consciousnesses participate a spiritual principle that he then identifies with God. Since the spiritual principle is the basis of all knowledge, Green is able to accept scientific theory, including evolutionary theory and textual criticism of the Bible, but he places these scientific claims within a broader metaphysical view, one which is built upon the assumption of God's existence and explicates his nature. Further, by arguing that the spiritual principle also relates individual actions and desires into a moral and social whole, he provides a metaphysical basis for moral life as one in which an individual lays down their private interests for the good of society. Green's final move is to argue that the moral values grounded by his metaphysics are already expressed in Christian dogma, such as in the call to lay down our individual lives to receive life eternal. He sees Christianity, then, as a divinely revealed religion that expresses deep moral truths in mystical rather than rational terms. Now, for all his influence and brilliance, Green's philosophical career was cut short by his early death at the age of 45. His work was detailed, but not fully complete, and he had expressed some doubts about certain aspects of it. Nevertheless, Green is typically seen as the first of the great British idealists. A second great is another Oxford philosopher, F. H. Bradley. Where Green emphasised the relational nature of reality as displayed in cognition, Bradley argued that relations were contradictory in nature. They represent a mental attempt to do two mutually exclusive things at the same time. They attempt both to separate elements of our experience from each other, and to unite them together into an experienced whole. Granted, our mind supplies relations to structure the world, but since reality itself cannot be contradictory, this shows that the world as we cognise it, or in his terms, the world as it appears, cannot be reality as it actually is. Bradley thought that the contradictory nature of appearance meant that we were justified in talking of reality as other than that which is mentally synthesised. Critical reflection on the mentally synthesised world of cognised experience leads us in two directions. First, it leads us to the raw subjective experience of feelings of all kinds, the unprocessed input we get through our sense organs, but also our emotions, desires, will, moral sensibilities and aesthetic delights. This kind of experience is purely given, it is our private, personal experience, and because of its private nature, it is felt as limited and finite. Second, reflection leads us, in our quest for truth, to absolute experience, 
where distinctions are not merely absent, as in feeling, but absolutely unified. In absolute experience, every distinction, including that between thought and being, truth and reality, subject and object, are transcended into a complete, unbounded and infinite whole. This unified experience is best, although imperfectly, understood as personal. It would be better, Bradley thinks, to call it superpersonal, as personal and more. And it is absolute experience which alone deserves the title of reality. As regards science, Bradley endorses it in all its forms, but only because it is useful. Science takes conceptual abstractions such as matter and energy and relates them to each other via laws. From these laws, useful predictions are made. Further, the laws provide a systemization of our cognized experience and thus explain to us the world of appearance. But science does not, cannot and should not claim to discover truth. As Bradley remarks, it does not matter so long as these laws work whether they possess ultimate truth or are more or less fictitious and false. Now, although Bradley believes reality consists of a superpersonal absolute experience, he refuses to identify the absolute with the God of religion. He believes the concepts of God and the absolute have primary relevance to different spheres of life, the practical and the theoretical respectively. And although Bradley remained a churchgoer, his relationship to Christianity would best be described as complicated. In some areas it was hostile, in others indifferent, and in others effusive. In typical Bradleyan fashion, he regarded religious dogma as necessarily contradictory. For example, faith worships the God-man, declares a kingdom both now and not yet, and identifies the penitent as both sinner and saint. Since it is contradictory, religious dogma cannot be completely true or real. But he also says that the man who demands a reality more solid than that of religious consciousness seeks he does not know what. A third great British idealist, J.M.E. McTaggart, differed from Green and Bradley both by being an avowed atheist and by being based at Cambridge. But he also differed from them in his philosophical method. As Z.D. Broad metaphorically put it, if Hegel be the inspired and too often incoherent prophet of the absolute, if Bradley be its chivalrous knight, McTaggart is its devoted and extremely acute family solicitor. McTaggart's metaphysical system is painstakingly laid out in the two-volume work The Nature of Existence. In it he argues that the absolute cannot be a single substance. Rather, it is a community of spirits, unified in an internal bond of perception and love. The eternal nature of this community is based on McTaggart's famous argument against the reality of time. Time, he powerfully argues, is contradictory. That we seem to perceive it is a feature of the nature of misperception. Further, the misperception of time is chief among the causes of error, a misperception that would finally be undone when time appeared to fully pass. At this theoretical point of time's elapse, our true eternal nature would become clear. In this sense, although he believes we are, strictly speaking, atemporal spirits, because the manifestation of that nature appears to be in the future, it is not fully incorrect to consider ourselves to be immortal. McTaggart's metaphysics can aptly be summarised as a defence of the fundamental reality of three things – truth, love and immortality. And he further believes that metaphysics is important, partly because of its capacity to provide comfort and to promote emotional welfare. But despite these convictions, he is opposed to religion in all its forms and especially targets Christianity. The absolute, he thought, could not be a personal substance for no person can contain other persons. And he argues in some dogmas of religion that God's supposed goodness, coupled with his creative power, results in various contradictions. The influence and popularity of British idealism peaked around the turn of the century and then slowly petered out. There are many reasons for its decline. The British idealist expert, Professor William Mander, groups their reasons into five the rise of analytic philosophy, the decline of religion, the growth of scientifically inspired philosophy, new methods of logical formalism, and the political impact of the world wars. The last of these was particularly unfortunate, as it meant the German roots of British idealism were viewed with suspicion. In the minds of many Britons, idealism was closely associated with Germany, and thus bore the intellectual responsibility for the horrors of the wars. But as Mander and others point out, British idealism's decline had nothing to do with successful philosophical refutation. 
it was only due to the 20th century change in the cultural and intellectual landscape. Now I realise that the philosophical views I outlined seem very odd to us in the 21st century, but I assure you that these people were not idiots, they were the intellectual giants of their time, and there has in fact been renewed interest in many of the ideas that they put forward, in part because of new scientific discoveries. But as the philosopher Robert Stern recently noted, British idealism itself still awaits someone dedicated to bringing its ideas to life in the contemporary context. Meeting that challenge will be at least part of the task of this channel, as I believe our current culture is suffering from a crisis of meaning similar to that the British idealists tried to combat, and so it is likely we can learn something from them. Another task will be to compare their thought with the analytic philosophy that followed it. To join in this journey, please subscribe. Thanks for listening, and have a wise day.